setting up the display to respond to button pushes. In this episode, I'm going to try to give you an idea of what's involved in setting up something like the ability for the display to send button pushes to the microcontroller and have the microcontroller respond and send messages back to the display. I'm not going to get into all the details about how you do it from a programming level. I'm going to keep it fairly high level so that you can get an understanding of what is involved without seeing all the nitty-gritty details. So I hope you find this uh, interesting. Uh, before you go any further, uh, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up to help me grow the channel. So let's head to the computer and I'll show you the process that I went through. In my last episode, the communication between the microcontroller and the display was one way from the controller to the display to be able to set a value here. This time, I want to make it two-way. So when I click a button here, I want to send text to the microcontroller and then have it respond with instructions to change something on the screen. In this particular case, what I'm going to do is just have it so that when you click Run, it turns on this LED as you can see here. And it did that by sending this Run command to the microcontroller, which then responded with this command to turn on the heat LED. Likewise, when I click Stop, it'll turn this LED off by sending the Stop command to the controller which then responds with this. So let me show you how I set that up in the editor. If we click on the Run button, you can see that there's a touch press event. So that means when I click, and before I've released the button, or I should say when I push down with my finger, it's going to execute this command here. Now this is a little confusing. It says get, but in this particular case, get is actually going to send a value to the microcontroller. And it's going to send run. Likewise, the stop button is going to send stop. Now, there's a little bit extra that it sends. If I bring this back up again and start, when I click run, you can see that it starts with a P. The P is a character that says this is going to be a command, and that it ends with these uh, three FFF characters, which look like a Y with uh, two dots above them to indicate that that's the end of the message. And that way, if the microcontroller receives this message in chunks rather than all at once, it can tell when it's received the entire message by seeing those three FFFs. I captured the actual signals going between the microcontroller and the display for that same sequence. So when I click the Run button, it sends out these signals here. This is basically the transmit from the Nexion going to the receive on the microcontroller. And this is what the characters actually look like. The microcontroller takes a little bit of time and then responds with these characters right here. One of the challenges that I ran into is right now everything's fine, which is basically this sends something and then this sends something. In theory, I could be sending a message from the microcontroller here. And at the same time, the display is trying to send something to the microcontroller. So I want to make sure that even if these two sets of messages overlap sometimes, I don't miss any characters. Let me uh, give you an idea of uh, what the challenge is. So I'm going to draw the display over here. And this display, as I mentioned, has buttons and various other controls on it. And then we have the microcontrol over here. And I'm going to draw this a little bit large at the moment. So there is a, a transmit line on the display that goes into the receive line on the microcontroller. And vice versa, there's a transmit line on the microcontroller that goes into the receive line over here. Now what makes this interesting is that internally, you can think of it as that uh, these are tied together. So this is a slot for one character. And what that means is, as the characters are coming in from here, one character at a time, it decodes the character and then puts it into here. And that means if you're not reading this character quickly enough, you're going to lose it. Likewise, here, you're transmitting one character at a time, so there's code running here that I write or that someone else wrote that is basically deciding when to pull something from memory and then put it into here or pull it out of there. 
this is where the challenge comes in because you need to make sure that you're filling this in and pulling things out here as they're coming in. What typically happens is you have three ways of doing things. The first way is called polling. And with polling, what happens is the code has to look to see if this one is empty and then add a character to it, or it needs to look at this one to say, okay, is this now full? Is there one character in it? And it needs to pull it out before the next character is decoded. The problem with polling is typically what happens is you're busy doing one thing or the other. So if you're busy transmitting, you're going to lose characters on receiving. So polling is not a good idea. The second option is something that's fairly advanced called direct memory access. And so that the idea here is you have your uh, memory. And so this might have different strings, like so, that you want to send or receive. And what you're saying with direct memory access is the code is basically setting this up. And then once it sets it up, it doesn't have to pull or do anything else. It just automatically goes back and forth. And there's electronics inside of here that will do this once you've set it up. And so it becomes automatic. It doesn't require any special code to keep running while this is happening. That works great for transmitting. But for receiving, the problem there is you have to say ahead of time how many characters you want to receive. And it's going to sit there waiting until you received exactly that many characters. So that does not work either. So there's a third option called interrupt. And what happens in the case of an interrupt is whenever this becomes filled with one character, it triggers an interrupt, uh, which I'll draw as a lightning bolt. And likewise, when this becomes empty, it also triggers something. Now, this trigger tells this code here, stop whatever you're doing and do something for me very quickly. What that will do is, for example, with receive, it'll stop what it's doing and then go to this little piece of code here that will pull this value out and then put it into memory location. And then it'll go back to what it's doing. Using interrupts allows you to have your normal code Plus, it ensures that you feed characters quickly enough to transmit, as well as pull characters quickly enough out of receive. So this is the approach that I used. And fortunately, with the system that I'm using, I didn't have to write the code to do this. I just had to write the code to use what someone else already wrote. So this was actually pretty easy to do. This is a simplified diagram of the code that I've implemented. And this took about a week for me to implement. Now, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated, or it may look a little complicated. But the reason it's set up this way is so that each of these pieces is very simple, and they're fairly loosely connected to each other. Once I have this set up, it means most of my work is going to be in here, and I'm not going to have to do much work with all these other things. They'll pretty much stay as is. This right here is where I'm going to put in the logic that knows how to deal with the injection molding machine. So this is what will handle, for example, the run cycle. That first has to close the clamp, wait till it sees the closed clamp sensor, starts the injection, waits some time, removes the air from the injection cylinder, opens the clamp, waits for the part detector to see the part drop out, etc. So that's all going to be handled in here. And this is going to be using external sensors as well that I, I don't show on this diagram here. What I'm going to do is kind of walk you through what I've built so far and showed you, which is the first thing is step one is you press the run button. When you press the run button, the next down controller, as I have it set up, is going to send out the text P run with the uh, 3Y characters at the end. And so that's step two. That's picked up by this piece that is provided by the system I'm using called Embassy. Embassy is a, a set of libraries for the Rust programming language for embedded Rust that allow you to write a program like this much more easily than if I had to do it from scratch. So this string here is picked up by this code here, which is going to be pulling it out one character at a time and then putting it into memory. 
After a certain amount of time, which is basically after a short delay with no characters coming in, this is going to trigger a signal that this is listening to. And so this will pick up the characters. It may not pick up all the characters at one time. It may pick up uh, them in several batches. It's going to wait till it sees these three characters before it does something else. So step three is these characters are received by this code here. And then what it's going to do is convert this from this text to something which is basically just says run. So that's step four. And so it's no longer a string. It's something that's, that's uh, more fundamental. It just says go ahead and run. It puts it into this queue. And this logic here is basically waiting for something to appear in, in the queue. As soon as something appears in the queue, this wakes up. And now it decides what it's going to do. In our particular case, once it wakes up, it, the way I've defined it, is going to tell the display to turn on this LED. So this is going to create a message called LED on, and it's going to be for the heater LED. So it will post that into this queue here. Now, this other piece of code is waiting for input. And when it receives a message, it's going to process that message. So it'll receive that message. And then it's going to turn that message into a string. And the string that it's going to turn it into is, let's see, what did I call this? Heat LED dot val equals one. And then we have the termination sequence. So in step A, eight, the main page is going to send this string to this code here, which will one character at a time feed them to the display. And that means it'll send this exact same string to the display. And then in step 10, the display will turn on the LED. So as I mentioned, this took me about a week to set up and build. And moving forward in future videos, I'll be able to just focus on this. And very soon, I hope, I'll be able to have this trigger things like the pneumatic solenoids, etc., to actually start driving the machine. So this has been a uh, different series uh, and a different episode than I typically have on my channel. I hope you find it interesting. Um, I will be getting back to more conventional things fairly soon. I'm going to be getting back to the watch project. Uh, and I have, of course, putting the machine back together and bringing it to life. Please help me grow the channel by subscribing, giving me a thumbs up, commenting below. And if you're already a subscriber, you can be notified when I have new videos by clicking the bell icon next to the subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.